What are some ridiculous history facts? Ancient Romans would put sandals on the hands of sleeping people then tickle their face so they would slap themselves. When the Romans laid siege to Themyscira, a real place weirdly enough, they attempted to tunnel into the city, the Themyscirans released bears into the tunnels. Claudius Drusus died in AD 20 from asphyxiation when he tossed a pear in the air, and caught it in his mouth, the pear tree was put on trial, found guilty of murder, and destroyed. The Spartans never built a city wall, figuring that their reputation alone would mean no one would dare attack them, but, during the Persian War, the Persians, who had already burned Athens twice, hired a Greek guide to take them to Sparta, but when they got there, they saw a kinda crap looking city without even a wall, they figured there was no way this place could be the mighty Sparta they had heard so much about, so they figured the Greek was lying, and thus Sparta was spared, also, I'm remembering this from reading it in the book Persian Fire by Tom Holland. It's quite possible that I'm misremembering details or that Holland's text identifies this as a legend or story. Still, the book is a fantastic read and I heartily recommend it. In ancient Egypt, servants were smeared with honey to attract flies away from the pharaoh. The first bomb dropped on Berlin by the British during World War II claimed no human casualties, but it did kill an elephant. The Battle of Bull Run, during the American Civil War, was called the Picnic Battle, because so many civilians from Washington went on picnics on the sidelines, and watched, but once the battle actually started, and the Union started to get its ass kicked, they all ran away, running over injured soldiers, and dead bodies, and generally disrupting the battle. This was actually a relatively common thing during the Civil War, I know it happened at Gettysburg too. At one time there was not only a Pope, and an anti-Pope, but also a counter-anti-pope. A Chinese emperor escaped an assassin by running around a pillar. After two hours, the assassin got bored and went home, and wasn't charged for his crimes. At US President Andrew Jackson's funeral in 1845, his pet parrot had to be removed because it was swearing. Colombia has a period in history literally called the Dumb Homeland period because of how incredibly dumb politicians acted at the time. Montenegro technically was in war with Japan for 101 years, and they signed a peace treaty in 2006. Montenegro was aligned with Russia in Russo-Japanese war, and they declared war on Japan, but they forgot to peace. When the Netherlands was occupied by the Nazis in 1940 many people fled to Canada, including Princess Juliana of the Netherlands and her husband Prince Bernhard of Lippe by Esterfeld, their daughter. Princess Marguerite was born in Ottawa, not knowing if the baby would be male, and hence the heir to the throne. Canada declared the maternity ward of the Ottawa Hospital extraterritorial, which means it became international territory. This meant that the baby would derive its nationality only from its mother, making it 100% Dutch. The shortest war occurred between Zanzibar and the British Empire, lasting around 45 minutes. There used to be bread stamps, burned into a cooked loaf of bread, to avoid bread fraud, as the government supplied the wheat slash flour, but some bakers tried to use sawdust, and other ingredients in the bread to make the wheat last longer. The bread stamps were baker specific, so they could track down where any tainted bread came from. If they were caught, they had to move to another town to make bread, or wait three years to continue making bread if I remember correctly. During the most critical portion of World War II, the Japanese thought they had sunk or disabled three American carriers when, in reality, they had only bombed the USS Yorktown three times. They were caught with their pants down when the bombs started landing at Midway. As St. Lawrence was roasted to death on a gridiron, he is said to have remarked to his torturers, I am cooked on this side, turn me over. St. Lawrence is the patron saint of cooks, and comedians. Admiral Zinovy Rostovsky of the Imperial Russian Navy was so notorious for throwing his binoculars into the sea during fits of rage that his staff always ensured his flagship had an extra crate of binoculars on board. Some more fun stuff about him, he would make up insulting nicknames for ships, and officers he disliked such as the lecherous slut the sink by themselves squadron or the guards uniform hangar, beat the tar out of crew members that disobeyed him, would fire live ammunition across the bows of errant ships and was known to pull other ships alongside his just to scream at its captain front of the entire crew. Despite all this he was considered one of the best officers in the Russian Navy, and was well liked by his crew, 
and took full blame for his defeat at the Battle of Tsushima in order to save some officers from the death penalty. So while he may have been hot-headed, and had high standards for his crew, he was ultimately a fair, and honorable man just doing the best he could with what he had, and probably better than could be expected of anyone else in his position. And honestly the Russian 2nd Pacific Squadron's voyage is a ridiculous topic in of itself, the amount of sheer incompetence is comical. Draconafel has a, fantastic video link one in description, on it, would highly recommend. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams died on the same day, July 4, 1826, the 50th anniversary of them both signing the Declaration of Independence. Adams's last words were, Thomas Jefferson survives. He was wrong by about five hours. General Omar Bradley was stopped by MP during the Battle of the Bulge in World War II due to them thinking he was a Nazi infiltrator. The irony was that he was stopped because he correctly identified the capital of Illinois as Springfield when the officer thought it was Chicago. The longest ever U.S. presidential inauguration speech was made by William Henry Harrison on March 4, 1841. The day had terrible weather, yet Harrison chose to deliver his speech nonetheless, running 8,445 words. In fact the speech was so long, and the weather so terrible, that Harrison caught pneumonia, and died on April 4, making him the shortest reigning U.S. president ever. The election of, Volodymyr Zelensky linked to in description, as president of Ukraine. People talk about how crazy it is that a reality TV star got elected president of the US, but I think this story is even crazier. Zelensky was the star of a political satire show called, Servant of the People Link 3 in Description, where he played the president of Ukraine. The show's last episode aired on March 28, 2019. Three days later, Zelensky carried 30% of the popular vote in the first round of elections, almost double the number carried by the incumbent president Petro Poroshenko in second. Three weeks later in round two of the election, Zelensky won with 73% of the popular vote. This is like West Wing star Martin Sheen defeating George Bush to become president in 2004. Just seems like the type of thing that'll be turned into a great documentary in 50 years. During the Cold War, there was an idea to drop XL condoms labeled medium onto the Soviets to make them think we were anatomically superior, and be more afraid of fighting us. Easily my favorite part of American history. Ancient Greek and Roman marble statues were actually originally painted and were colorful. A lot of the statues paint faded away and went away over time. Some people cleaned off the paint thinking it was debris or dirt and other people just plain cleaned and removed all of the paint off of them because they preferred the look of white marble. Rome was actually a very colorful city and it wasn't all made of just boring plain white marble. In 1908, there was a car race around the world that started in NYC. The route would start in NYC to San Francisco to Valdez, Alaska, across the Bering Strait, through Russia, and Europe, with the finish line in Paris. Cars were relatively new, and road infrastructure was limited to only metropolitan areas, and even then, a lot of it was cobbled stone. But what you might have thought, is how in the world can a car get across the Pacific? Duh, they would drive across the Bering Strait during the winter when it froze into an ice bridge silly. The race began in February 1908 and immediately ran into challenges, to list a few, cars breaking down multiple times, lack of usable roads, car hating people giving wrong directions, and oh yeah, snow. The first team reached San Francisco in 41 days, but quickly realized that the proposed route from San Francisco to Alaska did not exist. So the organizers allowed teams to ship their cars to Valdez, Alaska then continue on the ice bridge. Once in Valdez, the teams found out that there is in fact, no ice bridge across the Bering Strait anymore because it melted minus 20,000 years ago. Small oversight. Organizers then allowed teams to ship their cars across the Pacific to Japan then Russia to carry on. Despite all unpredictable, and hilariously predictable odds, the winning team arrived in Paris 169 days later. Highly recommend to listen about it from, The Dollop Podcast. Link 4 in description, there's more nonsense that happens that I couldn't fit in slash remember. The Cadaver Synod, aka the time a pope dug up another pope's corpse, put it on trial, found it guilty, had it reburied, dug it up again, and chucked it into the river. So, Pope Stephen VI really hated the guy that was pope before the guy that was pope before him, aka Pope Formosus. I believe their relationship would be called Pope Twice Removed. That line will work on two levels in just a second. Anyways, so Stephen Vi super hated him. It was pretty much all because of powerful families, and politics, and grudges. Still, Pope is a literally lifelong gig, 
and that means the guy he hated had been dead for a bit by the time Stephen Vai became Pope, seven months. So what did Stephen Vai do? Why he dug up the perma-dead previous pontiff, and put his remains on trial of course. He was found guilty, striped of his garments, had three fingers removed, they were his blessed fingers, was redressed in peasant garb, and reburied in a pauper's grave. This didn't feel like enough for old Stevie Vai, so he dug him up again, and had him chucked into the Tiber River. Stephen Vai was then imprisoned for the whole thing, and later strangled. It is told, by Herodotus, that when Xerxes invaded Greece he had to build pontoon bridges, which were destroyed by a storm before completion. Xerxes was so upset at what happened that he had every engineer beheaded, and sent soldiers down to whip the sea 300 times for its failure to obey him, and comply with his plans. Herostratus is the guy who burned down the Temple of Artemis. The only reason he did it was to have his name written down in history. Abraham Lincoln's son, Robert Todd Lincoln, was present at three different presidential assassinations. After McKinley, he decided not to accept any more invitations. Stalin used to take people on the side to have some drinks with them or invite them to join him for a vacation in his holiday home. Khrushchev wrote about how much he hated those drinking breaks, and vacations. Of course Stalin would try to get you drunk, and get info from you, and could decide he wants to kill you during the vacation, but you can't really decline his invitation. Khrushchev would also try to subtly get Stalin drunk as well, and get info from him. One time during a vacation with Stalin, Stalin asked him to dance a Ukrainian folk dance in front of a bunch of people. Khrushchev hated dancing, but he had to do it. Before Abraham Lincoln became a politician, he was a champion wrestler. With more than 300 bouts under his belt, Lincoln only lost one match in his career, and was inducted into the National Wrestling Hall of Fame in 1992. The Massachusetts Colony banned celebrating Christmas. During that time period many people used it as an excuse to get hammered, and party. Another tradition was that the young adults would cross-dress then go door to door singing songs, and demanding food. This clearly doesn't fit with Puritan lifestyle, so the governor banned public celebrations. People could still celebrate it in their homes if they didn't get too rowdy. I think it was unbanned when Massachusetts became a state, but didn't become mainstream until Christmas became a national holiday. Nashville briefly legalized prostitution during the Civil War. Union soldiers stationed there kept getting syphilis, so the new prostitutes were put on a large barge in the river. I'm a little fuzzy on what happened after that, but no it didn't work very well. So it was legalized, and prostitutes had to be registered or get a license, I can't remember which, and were required to have STD checks. This lowered the amount of prostitutes with syphilis because it was getting caught, and treated. That lowered the amount of soldiers getting syphilis and made the army happy. It was outlawed shortly after the war ended though. A very high-ranking Nazi, Ernst Röhm, was gay, was killed 1934, and Hitler knew about it, but it didn't bother him. Funny how homosexuals were then put in concentration camps. During the Viking era, there was a leader named Sigurd. He allied with a Viking warlord named Thorsten. He wanted to conquer more land, and expand his territory. He had already been very successful in doing so, this was until he feuded with another leader called Malbuktooth or Maltusk, as his front two teeth were abnormally large, and Bucktoothed. They decided to settle their matters on the battlefield, and both agreed on bringing 40 men each for the battle. However, Sigurd ignored the terms, and brought 80 men. Bucktoothed had realized he had been betrayed, but did not give up. They killed a number of Sigurd's men, but alas, they were overpowered, and were all killed. Here's the catch, after the battle. Sigurd ordered his men to behead all the enemies, and tie them to their saddles as trophies. However, as Sigurd rode home in victory, the severed head of Bucktooth pierced his leg, which led to an infection, killing him soon after. The British once sent a guy to China as a spy so he would uncover the secrets of making tea. Potatoes were not very popular as a food in France, like they were seen as fit only for animals. Not only that, but they were considered generally not digestible by humans. So a pharmacist named Parmandir knew they were good food, and wanted to popularize them among the working class. So he got a two-acre farm to grow potatoes, and placed armed guards around it at all times. People assumed armed guards meant something very valuable was growing there so they began to steal the potatoes. That's how potatoes became popular in France's working class. Subscribe and turn on the notification bell for more stories delivered to you. Thanks for listening. See you later.